I'm Diego Cordovez with Adam Schoenfeld. Welcome to The Scoop, brought to you by Full Tilt Poker. We're going to have Roy Winston, who uh, won the WPT at Borgata and has had a lot of other successes coming on in a little bit. But uh, first of all, we have a few minutes for the mailbag. Let's see if there's anything in the mailbag. <laughs> we, we got a couple of emails uh, since the last show, and actually uh, just the usual suggestions for guests. No one has any uh, specific question, but this one gentleman actually had, I thought, a very funny... Uh, Comments. So this this is worth worthy of a uh, some full tilt and scoop gear just on its own on its own merits. It's from uh, Joe Wirtz. Looks like he's at uh, Texas Christian University, and he writes uh, something I personally like to see. I'd like to see an all-out brawl between Adam and Diego. I mean, pure Kimbo slice style. Hmm. I think Diego is the advantage size-wise, but Adam seems like he could wiggle his way out of many a sticky situation, kind of like he did against Vinny Vin and Billy Baxter. And what's more, I think Adam could seriously injure and possibly kill someone with his unmatched wit and sarcasm. The correspondent obviously has observed correctly, <laughs> but I will slap an armbar on you so fast. <sighs> I've been watching, you know, I watch the Kimbo Slice fight, I watch UFC, I'm a master of the Kimura, various moves. We're going to wait till the end of the season, so in case there's any injury, so that the show won't be affected, but uh, we'll keep that in mind. For, I've got for Mike Swick, our fellow Full Tilt Pro, coaching me, and I'm going to slap a Swickatine <laughs> on you. Excellent. Speaking of Roy Winston, you've known him since you were a youth. Yeah, I've known Roy for over 20 years, and uh, I didn't even know he was a poker player, and then he wins a World Poker Tour. Yeah, fantastic. Well, let's just do a quick side-by-side -side comparison. I remember when I was a kid, Jimmy the Greek would match up the two Tell teams. The tape. Tell the tape. Now, uh, Roy became a successful anesthesiologist, cosmetic surgeon. He's won a WPT at Borgata. Now you... I've used cosmetics, <laughs> and I've played in a WPT. And you... Uh, no, no, but you, you chopped up one of the noon tournaments at the early age once. <laughs> a nooner, yes. And um, you didn't become an anesthesiologist. But uh, I'm an amateur psychiatrist. <laughs> You're an amateur I psychiatrist. I prescribe it. Yeah. <laughs> Just a quick tale of the tape, so to speak. Yeah. But Roy actually uh, has uh, also had a deep run in the World Series main event, and uh, it plays big cash games in LA. He's a very interesting uh, player. Roy's a uh, very unique character. So uh, you read a column with Michael Binger where he takes a very analytical approach, and you take more of the uh, the feel observation and the most memorable video clip of the World Series for me last year was when you were bluffing Kenny Tran and very gutsily fired three barrels all the way to the river on a scary board. So is this a persona that you're cultivating where you're you know on the border of some maniacal play and play hard by feel or uh, is that just the uh, the reality? Well you know it's, it's a multifactorial Answer in that um, Kenny and I play a lot of cash games together mm -hmm. at the Commerce, you know, uh, many times a week during the rest of the year. And I rarely, if ever, bluff into him. I respect his play. He's a very, uh, just an unbelievably talented player. And, you know, I mean, there aren't a lot of people that I'm scared of in poker, but I would put him at the top of the list as far as scary players. So I thought that I, I knew he didn't have much, and I was mm -hmm. pretty confident in my read. And I thought since he would think I wouldn't bluff, right. I thought it was the perfect opportunity to do it. Uh, unfortunately, I guess he uh, was able to puzzle that whole thing out. And the, but the funny thing that's happened with that, and I play, you know, I play a lot of cash games and I play a lot of tournaments, and everybody's seen that video clip. Everybody remembers that. Right. And everybody thinks I'm the biggest bluffer in the world, and I rarely, if ever, bluff. And it's actually paid a lot of dividends because now I play pretty tight, and I get called, and people ship it to me with funny hands where they think, <laughs> oh, he's got to be bluffing because I saw it on TV. You bluffed on TV one time. Right. You know, and, that, and that's the funny thing. So I played six days in that... Um, uh, main event of the World mm -hmm. Series last year, you know, and, and there are spots where you're bluffing, no question, but very, very few. Most of the time, it's a very tight, solid play. Right. So the, the, you know, they showed I think four of my hands, and one of them was the one of the maybe one of the biggest bluffs ever attempted uh, in last year's main event. So but that that was one of the most memorable hands, not just from last year, that I've ever seen on TV <laughs> on poker. And I thought you played it great, and I was very proud of you. And I was also very proud, Roy, that you maintained your composure. You know, I, I know you, and I've known you for maybe 20 years, but you looked like maybe a millimeter rattled, but you didn't exclaim, you didn't start sweating or put your head in your hands. How did you, did you feel okay after that, or did you feel better? Well, I mean, inside I was, you know, being ripped apart, and I'm, you know, I'm using all my Jedi mind tricks. Like, <laughs> Don't call, you know, that your hand is no good, throw it away. But it didn't seem to work, and... 
Uh, you know, I really, it used to bother me a lot more, you know, going back a few years when I first started getting into poker, when I would take a bad beat or something didn't work, I would just be, you know, oh, disgusted, crazy. But you know what? That's part of the game. And if you if you let each one of those things get to you like that, then it ruins the rest of the experience. You know, it's like you and I play golf together sometimes. If you expect, if you go out there with the expectation that you're going to hit every shot like Tiger Woods, it's a miserable day. I'm only going to hit 8 out of 10. Like that. That's <laughs> yeah, 8 out of 10. I just a drive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, on a good day, maybe 9 out of 10. Uh, just, I just want to review that hand just for anyone who didn't see it, Roy open raised with ace ten. Is that correct? Uh, either ace ace ten or ace nine. Yeah. And then Kenny was in one of the blinds. No, we were both. I was small blind. He was big. Oh, okay, blind. okay. And then you know, I hadn't attacked his blind all day. I'm very. I was very soft on his blinds. Right. Only when I had a real hand. It wasn't like I was constantly going at him. So I'm in the small blind. I looked down at ace nine in an unopened pot. I figured that's a pretty good small blind hand. Absolutely. And, uh, so I raised, and he you know insta called me. Um, Kenny's thing in a situation like that is he thinks uh, he always thinks I could be bluffing, but he also feels like he could probably outplay me after the flop. I think, imagine that was what was going through his head. The fact uh, that he didn't re-raise you is significant because he's an aggressive player right. pre-flop. He'll try and take the initiative when he can. And he so has, he, has a, yeah, yeah, yeah. he probably has a medium strength uh, yeah. hand. Now the flop came eight high or uh, well, all, hearts. Eight, all hearts. All hearts and an eight. Uh, eight was the mid pair. Okay. And um, and I led. I continued and led. And he smooth called. Would you bet about half pot? I bet yeah, sixty maybe sixty sixty five percent of the pot. Which you know it's funny because uh, in a lot of games I seem to play now, particularly the cash games, when you continue, everybody always thinks you have nothing. They thought you would have checked it if you had something. <laughs> right. Which and I bet I bet when I have something. But I good bet players when I don't have bet, something. And yeah. Kenny knows that also. Right. And you know when I'm when I have a big can, I want to build a pot. Of so course. For me, it's about. Uh, and I think it's the Doyle Brunson. His, he, his thing was just bet, bet, bet. Push, yep. push, push. So there's three hearts, and neither one of you has a heart. Neither one of us. Uh, as it turns out. So you bet Kenny calls right. fairly quickly? Uh, pretty quickly. Thinks a minute and calls. Turn? Uh, turn comes another heart. So now there's four hearts on the board. Right. This was the key moment in the hand. Right. Now you... Yeah, and, and I take a little bit of time, like I always do, and I led with about, again, two-thirds to three-quarters of the pot, which at this point it was big. And I had Kenny covered by a little bit, but we had very similar chip stacks. And we both had a, you know, I can't remember exactly, but, you know, had a million and a half in chips, which on day four was a pretty good, you know, we were top 25% in chips in the field at this point with maybe 250 people left, something like that. Right. Um, I mean, at this point, Kenny has to know that he really can only beat a bluff. He has no heart. You've bet again. Right. And, uh... If he calls here, nothing is going to change on the river. There's already four hearts. So he's calling on the turn knowing that you might be coming again on the river. I mean, this is kind of the key moment in terms of how it's going to, going to play out. Right. As it turns out, my read on him was pretty good. Right. You know, yeah. second pair. And, you know, he could have put me on an overpair raising from the small blind because it happens. Small mm -hmm. blind certainly could have, a, I have an overpair. Could have had top pair. And I certainly could have been in the blind flop. Two pair. There's a million combinations. And, you know, it's 50% of the time I'm going to have one heart in my hand. Well, right? Right. I mean, so. you, you might think you're bluffing with a low heart. Right. Uh, so uh, he calls again on the turn. Calls again on the turn. Now, did you consider taking your foot off the gas, or did you know you were going to fire the third barrel? Well, I wish, you know, in retrospect, I wish I, uh, no, I, wish I, I, had, I, I think just based on the results, you wish you Correct. didn't. But I thought it was a, an excellent poker hand from start to finish. So, But did you then think, maybe I'm just going to give up? No, because my read on him, I, I trust my reads. You know, and it's funny, getting digressing for just a second, I, I base most of my play on reads. And I, I, I um, not that I don't play my cards and, and the situation, but my, my read on you, once I have a read on you, I try to follow it. Mm -hmm. And that means if I have aces and I put you on queen's pre-flop and, and if queen flops, I'm going to get it off my hand. You know, that, that's one of the, that's uh, Daniel Negreanu, who, let me say, I respect him immensely in his reading ability and his playing ability. But his biggest leak in his game is he figures the hand out perfectly, and then he still does the wrong thing. Oh, which, right. you know, he said I, that. He's talked about this. Yeah, yeah. he makes yeah. the perfect. He he will call out the guy's exact hand, but then he calls anyway. <laughs> right. Well, you know, and it's funny. I did a thing for Card Player Magazine uh, in one of the articles well, with Lane Flack. Actually, where on the river he says he knew 100 percent he was beat, but he was getting good odds to call. And, I, <laughs> and Phil Helmuth in the same issue wrote right. a thing about a Jennifer Harmon play on Poker After Dark, where she was getting the right odds. So she still called even though she knew she was beat. And I really, right. I think there's no bigger bonehead play in poker. When you know you're beat, and, I, and I've surveyed a bunch of really good players about this, and, and everybody says when they know they're beat, whether it's the flop, the turn of the river, and someone makes a big bet and you've got to call off you know, most or all of your stack, and you know you're beat, but you have that miracle one in a million prayer, how many times you actually take those pots down, everybody says almost never. Right. And well, Phil, Phil had a great quote about that, Phil Helmuth, where he said, tournament players don't worry about pot odds, they worry about having the best hand. Right. Because... In a cash game, of course, it's all pot odds in the sense that it's either a positive expectation call or not. But in a tournament, chips are so valuable that if you make the wrong call, you know, when you're low on chips or, you know, for your valuable chips, it has a, you know, maybe positive 
um, in terms of just that hand, but in terms of the overall tournament equity, it can be very negative, you know, to make the wrong. Well, play. it's funny. I was over at Mattis House House the other night uh, watching him play a big, actually two big horse games, uh, you know, five hundred, a thousand, yeah. or whatever, on full tilt, and and I learned so much every time I sweat him and watch him like that. Especially when you can be online, so you're sitting next to him and he's explaining his place right. to you. For me, that was it's always fabulous because when I do it live with him, I gotta sit there quietly. But but um, Mike doesn't, but you do. No, but <laughs> 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 he talks about for both of us, uh, which I can get back to in a minute. But but it's it's um, it's such a funny thing listening to players who know you know they can they always know the other hand and they always know right. when they're beat and the player that's able and Mike is extremely good at this I can't call here because he has this this and this and I know this and how they put all those hands together and I think that we were in that discussion and I always kid around that that my tournament tournament play strategy is to survive till I'm heads up then I'm willing to gamble you know right. and you know it sounds kind of funny but there's some truth to it and Mike says well his strategy is to three hand it then he likes to gamble you know we're, right. and it's a joke because we didn't know that you know but it's and it sounds so silly but these people are so willing to throw all their chips in on these crazy gambles early when they have a lot of chips cuz oh I got to get more chips but right. you know the guy that has a lot of chips halfway through a tournament rarely ever wins it yeah. and the extra marginal chips are not means nothing not nearly as important yeah. now you did talk about your reads and obviously the read is very important but over the course of the hand, you might pick up new information, new reads. In this hand that we're talking about with Kenny Tran, on the turn, were there any was there any new information that, that you felt? You, you were confirmed that he was weak, but whether he was stubborn, which is a different kind of read, did you get any feel here? I knew he had no heart. I just knew it in my heart that he had no heart. Now, in retrospect, you know, the other thing I could have done there was to check the river and fire the, t fire, check the turn, rather, and fire the river, because... His, in putting the hand together, I think if I check the turn and fire the river, he has to fold. And right. maybe I shouldn't have bet that. He, he said, he, he talked to him later, he said, well, maybe he thought I was a bluff because I fired the turn. But in real life, if I had the hard flush there, I'm firing the turn. Mm -hmm. I don't care if I have the ace high flush because I want him to call. Right. I want to build a pot. Right. So You don't give him any chance to get away. Yeah. Now, he's not someone you're going to pick up a lot of tells on, but over the course of the hand, you can still see just how he reacts, how quickly he calls, just different things like that. Right. You know, I got a little this and that on Kenny, a little bit, but by and large, what, so, someone asked me for advice. They were playing him at a tournament table near the end of the WPT Championship, uh, and they said, How's, what's the best way to play Kenny? I said, I still avoid him unless you're really strong. Yeah, right. Which, you know, why put yourself in those bad positions with, you know, the best players in the world? That's what I think. Well, one thing that people don't realize, and it applies to a lot of these situations that are on TV, is that there's so much context that's not on TV. Like you said, you've played a million hands against Kenny in live games, so there's a whole history right. of how you play the hands, how hands develop, and a lot of times that's the case that people just don't don't pick up on. And uh, it's just kind of funny that you guys both end up at the same table in a, in a right. key situation. Well, we, so just to close on that hand, so at the end you bet a big bet now, uh, on yeah, the end. About two thirds of, of both of our and main pots are big. Yeah. Uh, right. He tanks forever. Yeah. Yeah. Now, on TV, they showed him thinking a little bit, but I was going to ask yeah, you, how long a, he, did he. Five minutes. It was five minutes of thinking. And then he said, at one point he said, Why do I think you're effing with me? That was his direct. That, that's the quote. Yeah. yeah. And, and then he finally calls, and then he starts screaming, you know, I'm a right. genius. I'm a yeah. The funny thing about that, we're playing a cash game at the. Um, Commerce, uh, I don't know, a month or two ago, and I won a pretty sizable pot from him. And one, and you know, Kenny has a lot of fans. He's got a few guys that I, maybe they're just jealous or they dislike him because they, he, you know, he takes their money. But this one guy looks at him and says, "Well, Kenny, who's a genius now?" So it was just kind of funny. <laughs> and it was only a slight bit of. Uh, well, you know, if you say you're a genius, that's uh, one, of the risks, all the time. one of the risks. Yeah. A lot of people in poker have big egos, but he seems like a likable guy. Very like. I get along really well yeah. with him. I've actually uh, played against him for a while now. I mean, I remember when he was kind of starting out and. Now he's really dominating in the cash games. Now, did you guys talk about the hand afterwards? Uh, have you had kind of a retrospective? <laughs> a little bit. And, you know, and I'll tell you one funny thing on the side that made me feel a little better. If you look at the way Kenny went out of the horse and the way he went out of the main event, oh, he I made know. the exact same calls on people. Well, oh, that's, he the makes flip side. Call. that's the flip side. I mean, he, he made a much worse call against a guy who really was unlikely to be bluffing right. where he could be drawing completely. Right. But again, I was pretty unlikely was. to be bluffing there. That was the funny part of it. And he, Gavin Smith said something very funny. He says, he says he thinks his name after that should be changed from sick call Kenny to always call Kenny. <laughs> 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 Made me feel a little better. Now, Roy, uh, I've, as I mentioned, I've known you for a long, long time, but we had lost touch and, uh, you know, I was on my travels and I knew you were a physician. Uh, and then uh, you came to my attention again when you appeared on the Live at the Bike series, uh, which was... Uh, an amazing concept where they would film the live games, the cash games. And you can watch it on the internet. At the bike. And uh, I was like, hey, that's my guy. And look, he really can play. Uh, how did you get involved in that? And uh, did you like the idea of having everyone see how you play on, on the internet? 
Well, you know, I think uh, in retrospect, it actually is that also has been a good thing because in those games, I was a little looser and I would bluff a little bit more. Right. See, I, I got an image of you as a very aggressive player. Right. And, and in those games also, but the players at the table were very corporation. Mike, who runs the banking corporation mm -hmm. for the bike, and there, there are three or four other young, aggressive players there. So the mix of the game and the way they wanted the game to play was a lot of gamble. And, you know, I think you can look like a loose player where you, you splash around a little chips in small pots, right. but when the majority of the chips go in, you try to have a good hand. You know, and that's a little bit of my style in the cash games. Uh, um, depending on the, on, the, on the lineup and who's playing in them, I think, you know, I adjust my play, but I think you don't want to sit there and look like a nit because then you never get any action. Uh, and if they think you're loose, you can trap them. And I think cash game play these days uh, is about trapping uh, and about getting a person to commit all their chips with a hand that's inferior to yours. I think that's, that's the way. I mean, I started playing uh, No Limit Cash Games kind of as my, my bread and butter a long time ago. And I think the game's always been about trapping, but the nature of the trapping has completely changed in the sense that now your only hope of trapping someone really is, as you say, generating this kind of loose image, active image, and then they just think, that, well, he doesn't have it, you know, again, or, you know, you're really uh, just uh, splashing around, splashing around, and now they come in. Whereas in the past, the trap was just waiting for them to have the, the one over pair, or one hand, and then, you know, they just can't let go. Right, and I, now I, people can let go. Absolutely. So. I played a great trapping <laughs> hand at the WPT Championship, which... Um, and it's just one of those things where the flow worked against Daniel Aya, who I think is, you know, like Kenny, I think he's one of the best, you know, high-stakes mm -hmm. cash game players. He's an excellent tournament player, yeah. you know, and a heck of a nice guy. Like, there's nothing, I got nothing bad to say about the guy in just any realm. Just because he beat a guy in a hand doesn't mean he's not a good guy. <laughs> well, absolutely, no. When I beat him in a hand, I think I like him more. Yeah. But I always liked him and uh, get along well with him. We always seem to be at a table a lot in big tournaments and big situations, and I respect his play. But we're playing at the first day of the WPT Championship, and it's a tough table. We have uh, Doyle Brunson at the table, Christy Gazes, Danny, and I'll leave a few names off because I forget them, but it was a very tough table. And uh, early on, um, Danny plays a lot of pots. He's, yeah. very, he's, you know, he's a very aggressive style, and um, he's very tough to read. And, and you know, he's a player that gives me some trouble. And again, I try to avoid him unless mm -hmm. I feel like I'm really dominating him. And I, I limped in late position with ace queen suited, uh, and he raised from the uh, big blind. Um, and I tanked for a very long time before calling. Um, not because I thought he had a better hand, because I wanted a setup that I really was unhappy with the call, Right. I think. And then uh, I, fl I flopped Jin. It was an ace-queen, four-flop, two hearts on the flop. I had no hearts. Uh, and um, he started. He, he led, led with a bet right away, and I kind of made a weak re-raise of him, letting him think I was just trying to get rid of him, and he you know, smooth called me without thinking. You know, this is also an event, I should say, we start with 50,000 in chips, and it's the first blind level, which was either 50, 100, or 100, 200, so the, you have a huge, you're very, very deep as compared to the amount of money that starts out in the pot. Uh, and I was able to trap him, get him to the river, where he made a large bet on the river, and I very flippantly kind of said, in, instantly went, you know, all in. And he goes into the tank forever, and he finally calls off all his chips to me. And he never showed his hand, but I got to think he had, he could only have one of two hands. He could have ace-king or ace-four. Mm -hmm. um, the only two hands I could put him on. Yeah. Um, and... I was very surprised I was able to do that, but getting back to the Kenny story, he saw me bluff like that, willing to bluff almost all my chips off on TV, and I tried to engineer it the same way. I know he's familiar with it, and the way the hand played out, it couldn't look like I was really that strong. The TV is one of the greatest things. Howard Letterer was on our show last year, and he said that good players merely have to assimilate how they've been perceived on television and adjust their play for that, in essence, and use that as a weapon against players who've made certain judgments or assumptions and that good players shouldn't fear TV because it's just another tool to, to manipulate people or to take advantage of people's uh, perceptions. I'm paraphrasing what he said, but I mean, uh, this can be the greatest thing ever, especially from a cash game standpoint where you want action and if you have the image of a guy who's willing to fire three barrels, you're getting three barrels of calls a lot of times when you want them. You well, know. and actually what you're saying is funny. I never thought of it you know, that way, but you're 100% right. And the thing that people don't see is like when I had my WPT show and I won the Borgata, yep. um, the show is 98% about the five of us playing, and then the heads-up play, they showed four hands. 
we played heads up for four hours, and they narrowed no it down to four hands. And the four hands they picked, one of the hands made me look terrible, but they didn't show the, I had a lot of hands where I think I made unbelievable lay downs, you know, I flopped the bottom end of a straight, he had the top end, then I got away from the hand, and things like that, where, right. you know, he had a better two pair for me, and I didn't pay him off. I, I really escaped damage a lot. Mm -hmm. Instead, they picked a split pot hand where there was, where I, he had a better ace than me, I think right. he had ace king or ace queen, and I had a terrible ace. And you and, to catch the Right, and the board don't pair. Him, right. <laughs> and that's the only way that I got saved. But, you know, I also had 12 million chips, and he had 2 million, so worst case, it would have been four million versus ten. I still would have had a good lead, um, but the point being that people see a very small sampling of hands, and then they think that they they have you. And don't forget, they're picking the most dramatic hands for TV. Right. You know, when they edit it, they're not going to pick the, uh, the the regular plain hands. They're looking for dra drama. And they're play and they're picking hands late in the tournament when the blinds are high, when you're really forced to gamble a lot more than earlier in a tournament. So. Uh, that's why you know I always get a kick out of the beginning of these tournaments, the beginning of the opening no limit, the beginning of the main event. The chip stacks are very large in relation to the blinds, and people are losing all their chips. You know, with a right, <laughs> a they face king, they flop a king, and they think they have. Yeah, and, you know, thinking it's just crazy. Right, uh, you know, thinking well on TV, you guys are going in with you know with any pair, at the, you know, when they put it in the middle. But that's a whole different situation, a whole different stage of the tournament. Now, Roy, uh, we're all full tilt pros now, but I hear you're going to bankrupt the company with your uh, merchandise demands. What's going on with that? <laughs> well, it's uh, funny that you should say that. I had a, a friend of mine, there's actually another, I don't think you actually met him here with uh, my, Adam was at my brother's bachelor party, but this guy didn't make it. A, another doctor friend of mine from Atlanta um, who's a decent poker player, very solid. He actually won the, the first WPT boot camp, uh, and um, he's a winning player, plays well. We are playing somewhere, and he saw the full tilt jersey they sent me, you know, that had Oracle on the back and stuff, and, uh, <laughs> which is a funny story there. But, but uh, he's, well, I want one of those. I'm like, well, you're going to wear it at the World Series? He says, yes. Yeah. all right, I'll get you one. And then um, the publicist I work with had the idea, let's get a bunch of those. I'll give them out to all my friends, and one day everybody will wear Oracle jerseys to the, to the, uh, to the World Series. And I, said, I thought that would be a fun thing. So uh, uh, full tilt was kind enough. They ordered me up a whole bunch. And, um, so you're prepared. I am prepared. I've decided what we're going to do it. I mean, you have to make a final table to have the to have it really pay off. Right. And, you know, and the, yeah. And then the really funny part of it is I haven't. Uh, I, I I actually um, used to make fun of the guys who wore all the jerseys used to go play poker, and it's like you know it's like middle aged guy wants to put a jersey on, and now I'm one of them. So I guess I can make fun of myself. <laughs> so. Yeah, you can make fun of it until you start getting paid to do it, and then. Right. That's my feeling. But I, they, they charge me for this patch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the funny, well, that's one indicator of how things stand. Right. The other I was going to tell Roy is that Adam ordered 100 T-shirts, you know, from Phil Tilt with, you know, Adam on the back and Showtime on the back <laughs> five years ago, waiting to make a final table, and we're all going to wear them. <laughs> just, just the boxes are in his garage. We just had to move into a storage facility, <laughs> and uh, they've been gathering mold this whole time. But... One day we're going to pull them out and we're all going to be there. Those who are That's still fantastic. alive. Those of us who are still alive. <laughs> well, yeah, and Adam has actually been an inspiration to me because um, when uh, uh, he started playing poker and started doing well with it, you know, mm -hmm. TV, this, that, the other thing, I think, well, if Adam could do it. Yeah, uh, right. And you know. stopping right. me. Anyone, right. You're a physician. <laughs> is, um, you say the Oracle leads to a funny story. Is the Oracle a self Given nickname or what? What is the genesis? No, of the I, I have this really good friend Joe McGowan, who's actually a great. He's like a little bit like Joe Navarro. He's the one who actually who taught me all the reads and tells, and he's a brilliant guy in 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 putting together a, a hand. Uh, I learned so much from him. But we're we're at the Bellagio one night, and uh, he's actually playing blackjack, and I'm standing there with him and watching the cards come out. And I just start calling, you know, seven of hearts, four of spades, <laughs> and they just start coming. I mean, a freaky number right. of cards. I mean, a statistically impossible number. You know, and I was I really getting any vision? No, but it was just one of those things, you know, how that goes. You get a feeling, you make a guess. And uh, so the dealer says, who are you, the damn Oracle? And so all night long, everybody starts calling me Oracle. And then we go, I go to play in the World Series the next day, and he's talking to, you know, Norman Chad or whatever, and he says, oh, yeah, the Oracle, the Oracle. And all of a sudden, it starts appearing in the thing, and in, in, the, in the, um, all the blogs, you know, Roy the Oracle Winston. And, you know, I figured this. I could try to change it and fight it, but I've been called a lot worse in my life. So oh, yeah, no, that's me. okay. Yeah. That's yeah. a very good one. I mean, yeah. I've heard some bad ones that yeah. the TV people try to assign to people that uh, you're right. doing much better, much better than average. Roy, it's been a pleasure having you with us. you got a lot of tournaments to go out and win. So uh, I expect bracelet. I do too. I'm just wondering if I have to buy it in the gift shop or whether I'm actually going to earn it at the tables. <laughs> anyway, thanks for stopping thanks, by Roy. and uh, best of luck to you, Roy. Thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks for joining us on The Scoop, brought to you by Full Tilt Poker. Don't forget to write us at thescoop at cardplayer.com. See you soon.
poker is a game of stories, complete with characters who are larger than life, moments of nail-biting tension, and dramatic conclusions. Poker stories are told through nuance and bold gestures. And no two stories are ever the same. We play at FullTiltPoker.com.